Okay, chair, you're live. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Governance Nordic Committee, which is being held fully remotely and in accordance with temporary legislation changes to allow the Council to continue to operate in an open and transparent way. Decisions made at today's meeting are just as applicable as in a traditional meeting setting, provided the number of members in attendance ensures the meeting remains quiet. I would like to remind members that this meeting is being live streamed to the public. Can I request that you all switch off your cameras and mute your microphones when you are not speaking and also ensure that you have your chat bar open for voting purposes. I've received apologies for absence from County Councillor Eason uh, and also Gareth Lucy and Charlotte Owen from Audit Wales. If there are any other apologies that need to be recorded, please make this clear in the chat and they will be recorded in the minutes. Chair, can I add um, uh, Councillor Lane as well to the apologies? Certainly can. Thank you. Well, apologies for absence is our first um, agenda item today. Um, the next uh, formal agenda item is the declarations of interest. Uh, if you feel you need to make a declaration, if, if councillors feel they need to make a de uh, declaration of interest, um, Please indicate in the chat bar and I'll ask you what the nature of the um, declaration is. I'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the public open forum. I have received no notifications that members of the public wish to attend and speak at this meeting. So I'll move on into on to the next agenda item which is the action list from the previous meeting. And at the moment, we don't have any outstanding actions. Now, we did have an item on the agenda um, for the Governance and Audit Committee review. Uh, now, I understand that this uh, item isn't available for this meeting today. Um, I just wonder whether Mr Davis would like to uh, indicate what the plans now are. For presenting the item. Thank you, Chair. Apologies, just having a bit of difficulty getting the mute off. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I've uh, been in discussion earlier today, and uh, just to confirm that I'll be looking to bring this report through to the next meeting uh, in January. Um, I've uh, liaised separately with uh, Hazel Islet uh, because there's a separate piece of work, I think, as you know, Chair, uh, being undertaken uh, looking at select committees. Um, and uh, the timeline suitably dovetail uh, in the new year and as we move up into May. So if, if you're happy with that chair and equally the committee, um, I, I'll look to bring that report through uh, in January. Um, and I, uh, just a sort of uh, note uh, for the record, I guess, uh, and a thanks again to, to, to uh, members of the committee who um, separately uh, have worked with me in uh, bringing uh, in allowing me to to bring together some sort of conclusions and recommendations which will obviously feature in the report that I bring forward in January. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'll just note now that um, Councillor Lane is with us in the meeting, so uh, there was no need for the apology. Um, the next item on the agenda, uh, item six is from um, the internal audit section and progress report on unfavorable audit opinions. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Watson to introduce this item. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, members. Uh, this is one of the regular reports that I bring to Governance and Audit Committee. It is a six monthly progress report on the unfavorable audit opinions which we issue in, within the audit team. And the way that works at the moment is that these are in relation to limited audit opinions. So we were giving limited or limited assurance audit opinions. Um, managers, operational managers have an obligation to implement the recommendations to make the improvements. And this report is an update on the progress of that implementation. So we're going back to opinions issued from 1718 and give, I'll give an update on a year by year basis as we run through. So this report is as at the 31st of March 2021. The previous report presented to audit committee was in March 2021, which related to a previous period. 
and then prior to that was November 20, as mentioned in the report. So this report is just an update on the limited assurance audit opinions, the most unfavourable we have within the audit team at the moment, and hopefully members will be familiar with the format. The intention is to identify any uh, consecutive limited opinions after we followed them, them up. And if there are any, then we will be advising audit committee members, governance and audit committee members, to call in the respective managers. This report is, is mainly for information this afternoon, as there are no reports in that category uh, this year. Um, and because of the, the resources within the team, we've not followed up as many as we'd have liked um, in 2020, 2021, 2022, sorry, 20, as at March 21. So as a run through, um, the if I could refer members to paragraph 4.3, there's a table there in terms of the number of limited assurances that we've issued since 2017-18. Eight in that year, in 18-19, there were six. In 19-20, there were nine. And in 20-21, there were zero. So the intention is that where we issue a limited audit opinion, the audit team will then follow that up with a, another audit review, a more in-depth audit review, within a nine to 12 month period after the final report has actually been issued to the respective managers and heads of service. So in 2017-18, as I said, eight reports were issued with a limited opinion. Six have been followed up and have had an improved opinion. The two in the table are events and food procurement. And to note that the, the way that the organization deals with large scale events has now changed and we haven't held any since we did the last audit. So that at the moment there's nothing to follow up. And food procurement is to be followed up in quarter four of this current financial year. With regards to 1819, we issued six limited audit opinions. Two have been followed up and received a more favorable opinion, which is reassuring, and the remaining four are in the table. With regards to Caldicott Castle, that follow-up has been deferred because as a tourist information center, um, that um, venue has had limited opening as a result of COVID. In terms of agency workers, that is due to be followed up in quarter four of the current financial year. Attendance management, that has been followed up and we've issued a reasonable opinion. And then the fourth one, health and safety of authorities existing buildings, again, due to be followed up in quarter four of 21-22. Moving on to 1920, where we issued nine limited audit opinions. Uh, they were schools and tourist sites. With regards to the schools, we haven't looked to do any follow-ups yet, um, primarily due to COVID, and they're in our plan for latter part of 21-22. With regards to the, the tourist sites, again, same as Caldicott Castle, a limited opening within the year, so very limited opportunity for managers to implement the agreed recommendations. They will be followed up in due course, either at the end of 21-22, or the beginning of 2223. With regards to 2021, although we issued nine audit opinions, there were no limited opinions issued. So just as a general summary, uh, when we issue the, the limited opinions, the service managers uh, agree to implement the recommendations. And that'll, I'll pick that up in um, the report later this afternoon. Um, but we have a high percentage of managers agreeing to implement the recommendations and they then have an obligation to address the weaknesses that we've identified before we come back and we redo the audit and we call it a follow up audit. Uh, in most cases, there is an improvement in the audit opinion after we've done the follow up opinion. If there are no follow ups, then obviously we will um, report that back into governance and audit committee. Uh, and just in appendix one, Chairman, this, those are the opinions which we use uh, within the audit team at the moment and how we categorise the 
um, the various risks which we identify in the audit work we undertake. I would add that we, we do issue a, a balanced audit opinion and it is based on strengths and weaknesses we identify during the course of the audit. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll just note the recommendations that uh, you made uh, in your paper that the audit committee note the improvements made by service areas following original limited assurance audit opinions issued. Um, and that if members of the audit committee are concerned about any of the audit opinions issued or lack of improvement made after the follow up audit review consideration to be given to calling in the operational manager and the head of service to provide justification for lack of progress and hold them to account for future improvements. Um, so I'm happy to take questions or observations from members of the committee. I can see that Councillor Murphy um, wants to come in, so I'll uh, hand over to him. Yeah, we uh, don't appear to have the um, the, the hand up uh, uh, function uh, chair, so I'll just stick my hand up. Um, only a, a, a quick question. I'm not sure has the full procurement moved on to our uh, collaboration with um, with with Cardiff. Um, I just wondered if that would affect the uh, the uh, audit follow up. I'm, I'm not sure if it has it or not. Uh, possibly one of the officers uh, in attendance can uh, let us know. Thanks, Councillor. I, I think that um, whether it has or hasn't, we still need to make sure that the recommendations have been followed up, uh, which we will do in due course. Uh, I can clarify that and and provide some further information to governance and audit committee next time. Okay, thanks. Oh, we've got the raised hand now, so sorry. Right, well, I'll just uh, thank you for that. I'll just see whether um, anyone else wishes to speak. But can I just check one little thing with you, um, Mr. Watham? We've got an audit of Caldicott Castle in 2018-19 in paragraph 46 of your paper and we've also got now I see you've got it down as Caldicott Castle follow-up in the 1920 yeah um, but yeah but with an opinion there so the, the follow-up did take place are these two different things no, they are the same same um, same audits. They, oh, it was it was due to be followed up in 1920, but for yeah. the reasons I've mentioned, it wasn't. Um, and the previous opinion that was issued was a limited opinion, so it is one report, Jim, and it's not two reports. So it was followed up in March 2020. Um, no, sorry, it was due to be followed up in March 20. Right, but wasn't. So it's still on the list of outstanding. Oh, I see. To be I see outstanding. Up. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Thank you very much. Um, so obviously you haven't been able to um, follow up on a number of the limited audit opinions. Um, and so this is going to push that workload into the next year. Is there going to be any issue in terms of resources in order to carry out the ones that you've had to hang on to and then any other ones that you need to do? Or is it going to be managed within the workload? Uh, quick question, the quick answer is that it will be managed within the workload. Um, we we take into account the follow up work which we need to undertake when we do the audit planning. Um, so we've got a, a list of uh, audit jobs which we need to undertake to give the assurance that we, we need. Um, that will be new jobs, that will be follow up jobs in terms of uh, limited opinions. And there, will, there will also be some follow up work for more favourable opinions as well. So all of that's taken into the mix and then we make sure we've got sufficient resources to undertake that work. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Smith would like to come in. Uh, yes, I think it must be very disheartening because in the further, the, um, further on in the reports, the lack of action after your works. So I do feel there should be more action, Chairman. It's a bit discouraging. You do a job, you make your recommendations and you expect them to be professionally followed up. And there's a very large percentage that regrettably aren't. So a bit frustrating for our officers. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Uh, just to distinguish, the, the follow on report does not include limited opinions. So this report just relates to limited opinions which we've issued. 
Um, yes, the, I guess so, I answered that. Yeah, it was just so, reading the whole agenda. You build yeah. a picture up, and I yeah. feel sad. I think I think it's a you know, it's a fair point, um, and that's why I reported into to SLT recently, um, and I'll come on to that in a moment when I when I present the second report. Um, the limited opinion assurance that we issued, um, there's generally a positive response to those in that by the time we come to do the follow up work, um, operational managers have implemented the majority of significant risks which we've identified. As I'm sure members will remember, there are very few times over the past few years when I've actually recommended to, to committee to call in the respective operational manager and the head of service having two consecutive limited opinion reports. But if it continues, then yes, we will um, advise members uh, call in managers where there are two consecutive limited opinions, which means, which means that there are very little action has been taken on the original report. But I think that's a fair point, councillor. And we'll be returning to, to this topic again when we get to agenda item nine. Thank you. In that case, I'd like it recorded that the recommendations have been followed by the committee. And I'm going to move on to the next agenda item, um, which is the audit of Monmouthshire County Council's uh, assessment of 2021 performance. And this is going to be presented by Rachel Freitag from Audit Wales. Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, this is just a brief item uh, from us. It's our certificate confirming compliance with the legal requirements of the local government measure for you to note. Um, we have brought the equivalent paper to committee in previous years, so hopefully the format uh, is familiar to you all. Under the measure, the council must produce an improvement plan and an annual performance report assessing um, progress against that improvement plan. Uh, so this is just our certificate confirming that that process has taken place in line with the requirements of the measure. Um, and all I would just like to add is that this is the last year that you'll see the certificate from us because the local government measure has been superseded by the Local Government and Elections Act. So yeah, just to uh, just to bring the certificate for you for noting really. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask either uh, Richard Jones or Emma Davis to um, just give us the uh, position from uh, position of Monmouthshire County Council. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Audit Wales for, for their work in producing the certificate and Rachel in introducing it today. Hopefully the, the certificate can members reassurance that we've complied with those legal duties as Rachel has helpfully set out. And also just to, to remind members, this relates to the publication of the, the corporate plan annual report for 2021, which went to full council in September and was published, uh, subsequently published in in October. Uh, perhaps if I may, Chairs, Rachel, Rachel said this is the last uh, certificate under the current local government measure legislation. It might be helpful if I perhaps just uh, mention to the committee, uh, which I know has already been briefed previously about changes to our performance arrangements under the Local Government and Election Act, um, and specifically our requirement to produce a annual self-assessment report, which, which will be completed on our 2021, no, sorry, get my right years, 21-22 performance, which is the current year in, work we're in, uh, and that will be undertaken following March 2020, and that self-assessment report will be reported into the Governance and Audit Committee to consider and add comment to, so you can expect that report to be added to your work plan shortly uh, for, for the committee to, to consider. Well, thank you both, that's helpful. Um, like to see if anyone wishes to come in at this point, either have to ask a question or make a comment. Councillor Smith. Chopsy, Mr Smith, I'm sorry, Jim. I just wanted to say thank you to Audit Wales, to your colleague, Mr Lucy, for contacting me and clarifying a few points that have made a lot of sense to me. So I very much appreciated that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you.
I think we can record this probably as a, as a satisfactory outcome uh, in this regard, as far as this committee is concerned. Yeah, fully agree. If, <coughs> if there are no further um, comments or, or questions, I, I move agree on to Chairman. I think it's uh, I think we we it's very satisfactory. Thank you, Councillor Higginson. I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda then, which is um, the strategic risk assessment, uh, which I believe will be presented by Emma Davis and or Richard Jones. So over to yes. you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Emma Davis here, Performance Officer. Good afternoon, members. The report you are receiving today is the six month update of the strategic risk assessment. As a committee, you have a specific role in providing independent assurance of the adequacy of the council risk management framework. And an integral part of this is the whole authority strategic risk register. The, uh, the risk assessment ensures that strategic risks are identified and monitored. Risk controls are appropriate and proportionate and that senior managers and elected members regularly review the strategic risks facing the authority. Um, the risk assessment only covers high and medium level strategic risks, lower level or operational risks are not registered unless they are predicted um, to escalate within the three years covered within the register. Uh, these risks are managed and monitored through other arrangements such as um, teams, service business plans, emergency management plans, business continuity arrangements, etc. Um, for today's report, there have been several amendments to the register to uh, ensure it accurate, accurately reflects the current strategic risks facing the Council um, and the more significant changes since the register was last presented to yourselves. Um, our adjustments to the workforce risk to provide greater focus on the issue of recruitment and retention uh, and workforce planning considerations. Updates on the pressures in adult social services due to the recruitment difficulties that are being reflected nationally and the exponential growth in demand and complexity of cases. Um, the ongoing risk of coronavirus associated with vaccine efficacy and variants of concern. Uh, and finally, the impact of changes to the socioeconomic environment as a result of various factors on those experiencing poverty and financial hardship in the county. Uh, in addition to these uh, changes and updates, two risks have also been removed from the register. The first is the risk of political, legislative and financial uncertainty for council services uh, and local businesses as a result of the e uh, UK leaving the EU. And also the risk that the coronavirus pandemic will have a considerable in economic impact resulting in business closures and job losses. Uh, information regarding those risks removed from the register can be seen at the end of Appendix 1 in your report. Um, but just for you to know, any remaining residual risks from those um, that have been removed have been incorporated into um, closely associated strategic risks so that they can be continually uh, monitored going forward. Uh, of course, as you'll all be aware, the pandemic continues and the Council continues to operate in a dynamic environment with controls in place to manage and mitigate as far as possible a variety of risks to service delivery and the wellbeing of our staff and residents. Much of the emergency response seen at the start of the pandemic uh, has been stood down, including the organisation's emergency response team, uh, the COVID-19 coordinating group and the wider Gwent strategic coordinating group. Um, as such, monitoring of risks associated with the pandemic has been integrated into the strategic risk register um, and some of the wider performance management processes that I, I mentioned just a minute ago. Uh, should circumstances, evidence and guidance change, emergency response arrangements can be re, re implemented at any time uh, should they be required. Uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. My, myself and um, Richard, we saw a second ago, are uh, happy to take any questions. Um, and again, just for you to note, those of a more technical nature, we may need to refer them to a specialist officer, but we will come back to you uh, with an answer. Uh, rest assured. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Emma. Um, I'll just note the recommendations. Um, I'll just note the recommendations in the uh, in your paper with the uh, members of the committee should use the risk assessment to consider the effectiveness of the authority's risk management arrangements and the extent to where the, which the strategic risks facing the authority are appropriately captured and that members scrutinise on an ongoing basis the risk assessment and responsibility 
holders to ensure that the risk is being appropriately managed. So I'm just going to turn it over now to questions and observations from committee members. Um, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, I was in a meeting uh, this morning um, where it was stated that um, there uh, seems to be um, an absence of the amount of funding uh, coming through uh, to replace the, um, the, the the EU funding that uh, has, has been uh, dropping out. Um, are we satisfied? I know we've taken some of uh, these risks out and incorporated residual ones in others, but are we satisfied that we've that we've taken sufficient account of the fact that the the level of funding that we had before won't be uh, replicated or certainly not in the current environment? Thank you, Chair. I'll then invite Emma or, or um, Richard to make a to 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 address that point. So if, perhaps if I chair could perhaps make a, a broader point about uh, Councillor Murphy rightly said how we've incorporated the the residual risks where they still exist from those removed and, and perhaps in terms of the specific points around uh, that replacement funding whether any financial colleagues on the call would be able to help. Um, I think it's a good point in terms of our risk arrangements how we then manage any risks we de-escalate and there's various avenues for that. I think in terms of specific risk around around funding, we have risk 4A and 4B uh, within the register, which typically talks around our financial risk management, uh, financial related risks uh, and how we are managing those. So certainly any potential shortfalls would be considered within that within that risk um, as, as appropriate. But obviously, if something became of such significance that it warranted inclusion in its own right uh, as a strategic risk, we would we would give that consideration. Um, in terms of, I say, the specifics of uh, of the funding, Councillor Murphy talks about, I don't know if any other colleagues can help, or if not, we'll, we'll take the question away and get, a, get an update. I see that uh, Peter Davis has got his hand raised. Is that about this uh, person, this particular issue? Uh, yes, it is, Chair. No, uh, apologies to Richard. Actually, it was remiss of me. I was um, um, having to deal with uh, something else uh, in the background there, so I just um, overlooked uh, coming in. So, um, so just in uh, just to add to, to, to Richard's input, um, I think it's just. Uh, Worthy of note that um, I think for members of the committee who are, I'm, I'm sure keep abreast of them, um, obviously press and um, you know UK UK government sort of announcements etc. So um, uh, and furthermore, we'll be familiar with uh, you know level uh, you know the levelling up funding um, that UK government has uh, brought to the fore of late, uh, and I know that uh, clearly the the two submissions the council. Um, put in for wave one were unsuccessful, uh, but uh, clearly we will try again. Um, furthermore, on the uh, community resilience funding, the CRF funding, which went alongside the LRF, um, we have been very successful in that. Uh, the vast majority of the uh, the bids and submissions uh, were secured on that one. This is sort of seen as a, a predecessor and a precursor to, I guess, what will ultimately come in uh, by way of the Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, which is in effect uh, the replacement the block of funding um, that will replace EU funding, certainly in terms of what local government has benefited from across Wales uh, since uh, you know uh, since the time and and, and up until now that we've uh, been uh, within Europe. Um, I guess the the exacting nature of how the shared prosperity fund will be distributed and the the competitive nature of how councils can bid into securing that funding funding is still to be made clear. So I guess in terms of understanding to Councillor Murphy's point, the exacting nature of the risk and how that will fall. We don't know yet. It is right and proper that it is a risk. And I would suggest it probably centres itself in and it's the position I think Emma and Richard have taken anyway. And, um, stepping down and removing the specific risk around sort of the consequence of leaving the EU. Um, 
it very much sits itself within the risks that center around financial sustainability um which as you know chair um is an ongoing risk uh, and we react accordingly as those risks manifest and become clearer as we move forward in time um so i can't you know clearly i can't crystal ball gaze and i can't actually answer the the, the question in, in an exacting nature but hopefully that gives you a bit of a rounded understanding thank you very much thank you very much mr davis um just give uh, Mr Murphy an opportunity to come back if he wants to. No, that's absolutely fine, okay. uh, Chair. That's the that's the answer I, I was anticipating, but I thought it was worth bringing it up. Yes, yes. Well, um, I'll I'll move on to, uh, to uh, the next um, hand, which is from Councillor Watkins. If you would like to come in. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I thought it was um, a very thorough document and very fascinating to actually read um, all of the detailed and the things that have gone in. So thank you very much for, for, the, for the report. Um, I had two particular um, areas of risk that I was highlighting today, um, and they're ones that have both started off as high level and maintained as high level risk as well. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to flick between screens, so um, forgive me if this starts. If I press inaccurate buttons. Um, the one was point 12, um, which was relating to um, carbon emissions. And the concerns I have there are how much are we actually focusing on resilience? Um, quite rightly, we say it as, as a risk that um, we may not be able to compensate for carbon emissions um, and we may end up having the effects of um, of climate change and so to what extent are we actually building in the resilience i've been on lots of flood um, meetings recently because mm. caldecott suffered with some of the flooding and i know many parts of monmouthshire do and there will be other aspects of climate change which will affect our residents so how much are we actually focusing on the resilience within our um, risk planning um, and the other one was point five no, it's going to take me ages to scroll to find that one um, and that was about uh, human resources and um, the retainment and recruitment of staff and then the ability to deliver council services. And I've noted that it says that we're going to try and um, improve the way we do our HR recruitment. So I was asked, hoping for a bit more um, detail on that, if it's possible, from the people who are actually in this meeting today, because it does seem that we have a very strict um, measured process in which we kind of try and confine um, applicants into our boxes. Well, do we start needing to actually think about how we might be able to um, get the right people in who may not fit the normal local government roles? But any in input on that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'll just uh, hand over to Emma or Richard to uh, provide any response they may have. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Councillor Watkin, for the question. And hopefully the, the document was helpful for you to, to get an understanding of, of the risks. I can certainly give some perspective around the risk 12 um, and the point you rightly raise about how we how we manage obviously our plans to reduce our carbon emissions but also the consequences of climate change and, and more extreme weather events and I think hopefully you'll see from the risk we've got two clear mitigating actions there one of which is about delivering our climate emergency strategy which is obviously clearly important the other one being about how we prepare and adapt to to the impact of climate change itself. Part of that is obviously recognised within the risk level um, being high, potentially showing that some of those factors we are looking to, to mitigate are outside of our, of our control. Uh, but in terms of some of those uh, actions we are taking to, to mitigate uh, against uh, you know, some of the impacts of climate change, such as flooding, we, we're working for our public service board, for example, on piloting some natural flood risk management techniques and also working on uh, climate resilience plans as as well as just a, a couple of examples of the work that's that's being undertaken. But I hope um, the way we've structured the risk and recognising those two points equally in terms of how we prepare and adapt and how we also look to deliver our climate, you know, our climate emergency action plan shows that that those are both being given proportionate consideration in managing, managing the, the risk. 
I understand that uh, Matthew Phillips is able to provide some more information about risk five. If you'd like to. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. I, um, I've been ear rigging in the background, so uh, I thought as, as Chief Officer of People and Governance, Mark Phillips, I should probably come in and speak speak to the, the HR element. Um, yeah, Councillor Watkins, you, you're quite right. It's um, it's about having a recruitment process that that is about genuine talent acquisition rather than being an obstacle course. And um, we we do actually, we, we do find ways already of, of um, changing how we go about our recruitment processes to find some sort of I mean, let's face it, we're after a competitive advantage over other people who are after the same the same talent. That the reason this has appeared on the risk register um, and has, has, has been kind of amended in this way is because of those those global forces at work, the skills shortage. And this is not a UK thing. This is not a Brexit thing. This is this is a global um, a, a global issue. And it's right, you know, from a strategic point of view that in my role and, and at SLT that we think about these things. So that, that's where this has come from. We've done um, a considerable amount of work on, on just some of our people data of late, which is why you see that the stats going in there about uh, our mean age and, and modal ages. And we need to think about what, what workforce age means in terms of um, trying to recruit new people in or retain the right people at a time when the market is, is getting harder. So, um, there's a there's a number of things going on and it might it might be that a, a separate conversation is more useful otherwise i'm about to take up quite quite a lot of the meeting but um certainly looking th there's a lot of structural um software based uh, elements that we need to think about so some of the obstacles that we have fall out to a degree of you know uh, web web based application forms that are as i think i think you said kind of one size fits all and there's there's much better and there's more modern ways of of doing that kind of stuff career development, leadership training, a lot of what we're doing in the what we're kind of terming the changing spaces space, you know, taking what we've learned from COVID and making how we work better, you know, trying to to bring those conversations down to the the, the individualized level of an individual employee who can present how they work best, have that conversation with a line manager who needs to think how the public is served best and find find ways of working that make MCC or continues to keep MCC a really good place to work and that allows us that kind of competitive advantage. Making a few, um, you know, structural tweaks in terms of how we really professionalise our whole workforce planning um, kind of outlook of which recruitment is obviously a key part, but there's there's a whole there's a whole chain of things that form part of this. Um, is it, sorry, is there is there anything I've, I've missed there in terms of your your question? No, that's great. And maybe I'll follow up with you um, outside of this meeting for any more specifics if I if I if I come to my mind. But thank you. That's really helpful. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for uh, contributing to that discussion. Um, I've got Councillor Smith. Um, yes, please, Chairman. Um, in the report, um, it, there's a reference to our commercial strategy that's under 4A. Incidentally, it is. It's very good. There's a lot of information in this report. Thank you to the compilers. Um, I picked up somewhere or I heard or I read that the government funding, I can't remember the term for it, which um, the interest rate undercuts the public workload. We undertook so many millions of borrowing. How uh, Councillor Murphy will know, was it 30 million, 50 million uh, funding from that fund? And we have. Did, how many from here? 50. 50. Well, that's a nice round number, isn't it? Uh, so we have our commercial strategy. Now, what I picked up from somewhere, the government is saying you may not use this funding for basically renting, which is a commercial strategy. And I'm just wondering what implications that has for us. I haven't found anything else out. I haven't bothered to try and follow up. But is it going to be an edict from somewhere? And if it's national government, because we borrow over the border, we borrow from here or there everywhere, don't we? That's appropriate. But is the government going to be able to say, this applies throughout Britain, you may no longer fund this sort of strategies, commercial strategies. What impact would that have on the existing initiatives? And would it impact on the remaining funds that we have? still hold within that preferential funding. 
so it's rather because it has been a very good initiative. It has earned us money, which is what is needed for Monmouthshire. But I can see a lot of problems if this becomes a reality. You may not get involved in this sort of initiative. So thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Smith. That's very, very well put and very relevant issue for this committee. I'm not um, completely convinced as chair that this falls uh, within the uh, remit of the paper we're currently considering, um, except if this needs to be flagged up to the risk register, then then that it should be. Um, because it's flagged. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to just shut everyone up, Councillor Smith. I'm yeah, going to just say I'm happy to take a response from officers, but if the issues surrounding the investment committee and so on and the, and the financial management uh, as was reported in the most recent treasury report uh, if it does uh, require um, a more detailed response to you i'm going to probably uh, ask them to provide you with a briefing so um, is this have i got an indication that mr davies would like to speak thank you chair i'm not sure whether you can see me um, i'm having slightly i can see you fine yes okay okay thank yeah. you um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief in my response because um, I think the committee will understand and be aware that um, uh, one of the requirements uh, with the investment committee is that there is an annual report that is brought back in front of the governance and audit committee um, that will be brought uh, back to committee uh, early part of next year. Um, and uh, I think we'll quite specifically look to respond uh, to Councillor Smith's question. Uh, and questions and observations. Um, so, yes, uh, in brief, um, I guess the Chancellor's has tightened um, the ability for councils to be able to use PWLB borrowing where it relates to borrowing uh, for commercial activity that is almost singularly for yield and return. Yep. However, I think that uh, Councillor Smith will also be aware that that's often not been the intent of many councils and certainly not us. Um, you know, we've looked to try and benefit in a reciprocal way by the uh, the returns that we've generated from our commercial investments. You know, that's been ploughed back into being able to maintain frontline services. I think where where the changes are going to probably hinder us going forward is that we're going to probably have to demonstrate what's called, I guess, market failure. So uh, and it, will, it will equally hinder us, I think, in terms of being able to make investments outside of the county boundary uh, going forward. Uh, that argument is going to be uh, a little bit more difficult to, to make to the Public Works loan, Loans Board. So yes, we are going to have to tread a little bit more carefully. Uh, we'll go eyes wide open on that. Um, we are taking some advice at the moment in terms of the two. In, uh, so our, uh, just to be clear, the two investments that we do hold in Castlegate and Newport Leisure Park, uh, they are not affected. Uh, you know, they're retrospective. Those investments have been made. The only thing we're going to be a little bit careful about and where we're getting some advice at the moment is where we are looking to invest further in those specific investments. Um, but again, I'm relatively positive in terms of our initial assessment on that one that that that, that we won't be hindered um so hopefully chair that's a that's a useful uh, sort of rounded update and as i said i'll be bringing a report through anyway in the new year uh, which will i'm sure touch on this thank you that, that's very helpful thank you uh, mr davis councillor smith do you wish to uh, make a further contribution no um that's fine. I, as I say, I picked up this information somewhere and just wondered, well, not wondered, read the report and thought, gosh, this could have bad implications. Thank you very much for the explanation, Peter, and look forward to the uh, the report. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Do I have any further uh, contributions from, from the committee? not receiving anything. So therefore, uh, we will just note to the committee that the recommendations uh, have been noted and followed by the committee, uh, including the note that we should continue to scrutinise on an ongoing basis uh, risk assessment uh, 
to see that risk is being appropriately managed. So I'll move on then. I'm going to move on to agenda item number nine, the implementation of agreed internal audit recommendations. And this is for Mr. Watson again to introduce. Thank you, Chairman. A uh, second report for me this afternoon, and this one is in relation to the progress of the implementation of internal audit recommendations as at 2019-20. And this picks up uh, Councillor Smith's point that she made earlier in this afternoon, and um, we'll come into the detail of that as we, as we I progress. So this is in relation to all internal audit recommendations that have been made in reports which have been finalised up to and including 2019-20, i.e. 31st of March 2020. Seems a bit of a, a time lag there, um, but the, we are quite generous in terms of our follow-ups because if reports are finalised in March 20, then we will generally give uh, the operational managers six to nine months um, timeline to actually implement those recommendations. So we wouldn't necessarily follow those up until the last quarter of um, that financial year, which would be 2021. So we were reporting in March 2021 of the previous financial year. So some managers have been luckier than others in terms of having longer to implement the agreed recommendations, um, but this is it's a moving feast and we, for reporting purposes, we do need to cut off at a point in time. So this is a snapshot of progress. Um, it was previously reported to Audit Committee in July 2019. So the intention is moving forward that this will become an annual report and I'll make sure that we're back on track moving forward. So in terms of my overall opinion, I have to provide to Governance and Audit Committee. Uh, it's made up of the individual audit opinions we issued to the individual audit jobs which we undertake. And as mentioned already this afternoon, it's based on strengths and weaknesses identified during the course of the, the, the audit. And we categorise the weaknesses which we've identified, show, which will come into and shown in the appendix. When we do the audit, we issue a draft report that's discussed with the service managers. And before we finalise the report, we get an agreement of from the operational managers on their implementation of sorry, their agreement of the recommendations which we expect to be implemented. As you can see from the report, 90% of our recommendations are agreed by operational managers. So we, by the uh, 31st of March 2021, we would expect the majority, a large majority of all the recommendations we made up to 1920 to have been implemented to demonstrate some level of improvement with the internal control environment, governance arrangements and the risk management processes that are in place within the various services across the organisation. Where so we've issued limited opinions, uh, we undertake a full follow-up audit and that information has been reported to you already this afternoon. The data in this particular report excludes limited assurance opinions. So we're just concentrating on the more favourable opinions which we issue. So the higher risks would be within the limited assurance. Nonetheless, we do issue some um, quite key recommendations which need to be followed up within the, the more favourable audit opinions as well. Within the team, uh, we would follow up as, as much as we can in terms of the recommendations that are made. And we do that within a, a six to 12 month period after the final report has been issued. But due to limited resources within the team, we can't follow up everything. We can't follow up all recommendations. So we do on a sample basis. Uh, paragraph 7, 3.7 should actually read as at 31st of March 20. We had 375 recommendations made which were due to be followed up and that does include uh, exclude the limited assurance opinion audits and that relates to recommendations made up to 1920 or maybe in previous years if they've not been signed off and the summary of 3.8 shows that we had 98 percent recommendations accepted in our sample of follow-ups we the audit team tested 29 percent and slightly disappointing 
in that only 36% of those recommendations which we tested were actually implemented. What's also um, concerning is that only 25% of the significant recommendations we made were implemented as well. And we'll come into some detail as we progress through the report. So in terms of the 107 uh, recommendations that were followed up by the team, as 29% uh, of the population, uh, the information is um, in the table which follows in the, in the appendix. So we had 30% of water recommendations had been implemented, 19% partially implemented, 36% not implemented, 5% were ongoing, 4% were considered no longer to be a risk for managers, and they accepted the risk of not implementing that recommendation. The, within the appendix as well, I've given a, a year on year comparison, and it's slightly disappointing to note that the actual recommendations that have been implemented has decreased from 68% in 1718 through to 36% in 2021. Of the 107 recommendations that we did review and follow up, 12 were identified as being significant, and we were able to identify that 25% of those had been fully implemented and 8% par partially implemented. So of the recommendations we were not followed up, not in our sample, there were 268 recommendations, of which 47 or 18% were categorised as significant. So in, in terms of the, the um, decrease in performance, this information has been reported, been reported to SLT uh, and they have committed to work with their operational managers uh, to progress the implementation of agreed audit recommendations and provide an update in due course. And uh, following that update, I will report back into to Governance and Audit Committee in due course and hopefully have some improvement in terms of the performance. So if I can refer members to the, the appendix, appendix two shows the progress of implementation and the decrease implementation over the, the periods from 1718 through to 21. That's split into implemented, partially implemented, not implemented, etc. For the 107 uh, recommendations that we, we did sample check, uh, that's split out into the various directorates. Again, those of which have been implemented are not implemented or partially implemented. And then we've also split down the significant recommendations per directorate as well, in terms of the status of implementation. Appendix four identifies the individual jobs and the number of recommendations made in those jobs and the status as at 31st of March 2021. Members will note that uh, there are two in particular that stand out in terms of volunteering, um, but the, the, because of the, the pandemic, uh, the volunteering service was, was stood down within Monmouthshire uh, and has not um, been resourced appropriately because the the, the lead on that has now taken a secondment um, with the, the, uh, the city region. Mobile phones is, uh, could also be seen as a concern. Uh, that's unfortunately fallen between two stones in terms of service area responsibility. That has been progressed at the moment, um, but a complete review of mobile phones usage is going on within the organisation, and that's likely to change significantly as well. So at that point, Chairman, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasser. I've got uh, Mr. Phil Murphy. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, only a, 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 a quick point, uh, Andrew. Um, do you think the drop off in, in uh, enacting the uh, recommendations is uh, substantially down to the COVID problems? Um, everybody had to repurpose um, 
people were, were off. There was all sorts that were, we all know what the problems were. Yeah. Do you think that that's a significant factor in, in that or do you think there's something else? Uh, partially, yeah, because um, service managers were directed elsewhere, their priorities were elsewhere, they had to deal with um, frontline service provision rather than implement the, um, the agreed audit recommendations. So that did have an impact, yes. Um, reasons why the um, there's been a significant reduction, uh, I'm not sure. Um, we, we do follow up the best we can. Uh, we, we get managers to provide us with evidence to, um, to check and verify that the recommendation has been implemented. And, and now we're working with managers to try and address that problem. Again, we've got support from SLT recently to move that forward. And as I said, hopefully when I report back into Governance and Audit Committee next time, there'll, there'll be a sign of improvement. OK, thanks for that. I see from uh, your paper in 318, would I be right in uh, taking this to indicate that um, once senior managers have pursued this, as you've described, we can expect a re further report to this committee in about six months? Uh, yes, Chairman, that's right. Um, I think because we've now got the support of SLT uh, moving forward, that uh, should generate an improvement. We will be we will be checking this as we, as we progress. As I say, so it's a moving um, feast, really, in terms of it's ongoing. We're always looking at follow ups. Free information has always been provided to us. Um, so I'm hoping that the that they will provide me with feedback within the next month or so. Um, but and if they do, I will be reporting to Governance and Audit Committee earlier. But I think we've set ourselves a, a realistic deadline for all um, action, all, all progress to be uh, assessed and verified and reported back to Governance and Audit Committee within six months. Thank you for that. OK. Thank you. I'll just note your recommendation uh, that the Governance and Audit Committee should consider your report identify any concerns of non-implementation of audit recommendations and where appropriate. You do say they're calling in any managers for further explanation, but I think the situation is that um, once you've started drilling down into what's going on in, in the detail, you may have some recommendations for us then. Um, but that would be ultimately the outcome that we would want to call in managers for further explanation as to why implementation of actions has not been as productive as expected. Uh, Mr. Davis, you'd like to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's probably my last contribution into the meeting as well because um, um, I, I need to leave the call at three o'clock. But um, um, I've got very, very little to add, actually. Um, I can't um, really um, uh, add anything further to Andrew's input. Um, um, all his points uh, made are, are very valid and appropriate. Um, I just wanted to come in, I guess, just in terms of my role and in terms of sitting on um, the SLT uh, senior leadership team. So I think um, as Andrew's uh, touched on, um, and I'd like to think, Andrew, that um, we've continued to strengthen um, your presence at SLT. Um, uh, and I think that's that is and I'm sure will continue to bear fruit um, furthermore. And I think through strengthening the relationship equally with chief officers and presence on DMTs as well. Yeah. And yeah. I think when we reflect on the report that we've got here now, um, yes, it's certainly not where we would want it to be. Yes, there are some mitigating circumstances, but you know we're bringing ourselves out of the pandemic. Pandemic is not gone, and let's just be clear, there is a huge amount of pressure still remaining on services. Um, however, I think um, I think it's a fair, I think it's fair. Obviously, you were in the discourse, Andrew, with SLT. Um, Chief Exec was very clear in terms of drawing conclusion on this and his expectation on chief officers to step away from that meeting and that conversation and acting accordingly through DMTs, etc. So, you know, we do take this seriously. Um, and 
I think it's more than a hope. I think an expectation. I think that uh, when this is brought back in six, six months' time, you will see a significantly improved position. Um, I think one positive for me, um, and whether me and Andrew see completely eye to eye on this, but um, the you know and Andrew's taken as Andrew said earlier, the assessment that Andrew's reported is at a point in time that's all he can do. Um, it's based on information he's captured and his team's captured at any one point in time. Um, I've at least had the I've, I've at least had the benefit of a, a few conversations subsequently with some of the officers where there's been some deficits reported here, um, and it's been positive to see that actually action has been taken in the interim period. So that at least comforts me, and together with the DMT action and the commitments from chief officers, I'd like to think when we come back in six months that we will see a marked improvement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Well, if we have no further comments or observations uh, from members, I'm going to move on to the next agenda item. Thank you very much, Thank you, uh, Chairman. everyone, for your contributions there. Um, the next item on the agenda is our forward work planner. Uh, the forward work planner has been provided. Um, unless uh, there's a, a contribution to be made now, um, then anyone would like to um, let us know if there might be some changes or additions. Um, I see Mr Jones has um, appeared. Uh, do, do you, would you like to uh, make a contribution? Yes, please, Jen. And apologies, you missed me not to, to mention this to you prior to the meeting. Um, I see on the full work programme for the next meeting, we've got uh, the overview of performance management arrangements report to come to the committee, which is a standard report we bring to you evaluating our performance arrangements. As I mentioned earlier, there's quite a bit change in those, so we apply the requirements under the Local Government and Elections Act. Uh, in those performance arrangements and we'd want to incorporate those changes within the briefing we provide to to the committee um, and in order to do that effectively it may be most beneficial to delay that to a, a future meeting but but not so far away that uh, we don't do that in a timely manner either so if the committee is agreeable we move those back move them back possibly to the February meeting well thank you thanks for letting us know If there aren't any other contributions, um, I'll move on. Um, to consider the minutes of the uh, previous meeting, which is on 3rd of November. Yeah, and move they accept the chairman. All right, we've got a, a motion to accept from I'll second Higginson and a second from Councillor Murphy, I think. OK, we'll accept that the minutes of the meeting are an accurate record. So the only thing I now need to do is to just note the date of the next meeting, which will be the 13th of January at two o'clock. Which makes it appropriate for me to offer everyone season's greetings and a happy new year uh, before we convene <laughs> again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Same you, thing with Chairman. <laughs> happy Christmas. Yeah, happy Thank Christmas. You. Yeah, Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs>